Welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Adrian, for having me on. My name is Sean Walsh. I play guitar and sing in the band Skull Shitter. And Sean, how would you describe the music of Skull Shitter? We're primarily a grindcore band with some death metal and some sort of like proto death metal influences. And we really approach our sound from a psychedelic standpoint, which doesn't always come through in the sound, but it comes through in the approach, certainly the live performance. And when we talk about these psychedelic influences, what, what are we talking about uh, exactly? Is there... We're talking about psychedelic drugs, basically, <laughs> and how that can be interpreted in a, in a death metal or grindcore setting. So this kind of just comes back to about 10 years ago when we were getting started. Our bass player, Ryan, was just showing up to practice, like tripping balls, like out of his mind kind of a thing on the week. Like, you know, he showed up on a Saturday and hadn't slept on Friday night, and you know. And it just kind of became one of those things where it started happening a lot at rehearsal, and then it's like, okay, well, can we do it live? And so that was certainly, uh, you know, an approach that was taken. And then it, I think it, when you're, whenever you're experimenting with, with expanding your consciousness or keeping an open mind in general, that just sort of applies to our take on the music that we make. We like to have a fine kind of like Ryan, have a balance between the genre rules, which are important, but also not being, not letting those rules like stagnate our sound and making sure that we're really producing something that we think is, is fresh and different and has a, a bit more openness to it. Now, in my experience, grindcore is one of the hardest types of music to play. Do these uh, these extra elements, these psychedelic, psychotropic substances that you use, make it harder to play? Yeah, it can. Uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty open with this. In fact, Aaron Aaron Nichols, who runs Nerve Alter, I mean, he actually said this to me one time. He's like, you know, you guys take acid and you and you get up on stage and you try to play grindcore, and sometimes it's fucking amazing, and sometimes it's not. <laughs> And so, you know, it's the, the practice like really helps to just have like the confidence, I think, like maybe even more than the playing, but just like being confident in, in yourself when you're on psychedelic drugs that can really make or break things like how your, your mental space is when you're coming into it. So having the confidence to just think that it'll be okay and you're going to play the set and that's going to be great goes a long way to that performance. But yeah, sometimes there are times, there have been also times where like, Let's say Ryan, who's a, who plays bass in Skullshitter, and Robert, like they may have, I remember one show in particular, they took acid and they didn't tell me at all. And I was like almost completely sober. And like we had played like one or two songs and I was like, what is going on? I wasn't with them at all. And then I looked over and I saw Rob and I could tell that he was extremely high. And, and I was like, oh, okay, that's like, they're, they're on their, they're on their thing. Let me just try to hang out, you know? So it, it, it can be challenging. Yeah. I mean, in addition to what you guys are are imbibing before you play, there are, there also are elements, uh, noise elements, and sometimes like classical psychedelic elements to your music as well, right? Yeah, yeah, there are. There's when you're talking about the the different instrumentation, and like you mentioned, the noise and and the uh, the synthesizer type of things. That was something that really came up. That sounded inspiring. Was I, I noticed. In the last probably you know five years or so, there's been a lot of death metal bands, and even going back to Morbid Angel, but there's been a lot of death metal bands recently that have kind of like psychedelic, like synthesizer, um, maybe not even psychedelic, but maybe more like uh, John Carpenter esque songs on their records. And I got, I just got inspired to do something like that, but not have it just be like, oh, let's just have someone play, you know, a, a standalone. Like just have a track that's just synthesizers, like in you know, come kind of. I kind of think it's like almost out of context. So on the bleeding out, that we did a split with bleeding out that came out in 2019, and we have like a kind of John Carpenter esque song, but it's all live instrumentation. There's no keyboards on it at all. We're, we're playing everything. And then on our newest record, we have a song with Robert's brother, who Jesse, he's actually a keyboard player. So we had him do a song and we, we have us superimposed on it. And then we have another song that is like almost like an acoustic song. We brought in uh, like a very percussions and weird sounding drums. And we made a very different sounding song for us to be like almost like a palate cleanser. 
As, as far as the the keyboard parts and what you described as the the John Carpenter elements, are you playing most of those? Yeah. So we have one song on our new record, Go Claw, that features you know Robert's brother Jesse on keyboards, but. That was, I had given him a piece. I wrote a bass line that, that Ryan plays on another part of the record. I gave that to, to Jesse, and then I let Jesse really kind of add on to it, but gave him the, the foundation point there. So, what, you know, I wanted to have something I was very particular about this bass line, but I didn't want Jesse to just be like showing up and being told exactly what to play. So I gave him the bass line, and then I really let him do whatever he wanted with it from there. So he added in a little bit of a, a subtle counter melody to it, and he did that noise stuff at the end of it, and it really came out great. And we'll speak a little bit more about Jesse and the other guest contributors that you have on the album. Sure. Can you tell me a little bit about how how Skull Shredder came together, how you guys met? Yeah, absolutely. We were all three working at a hotel together, at a hotel called the Ace Hotel in New York. And we were all, Ryan and I were working the overnight shift together. And Robert was, he was actually not working for the hotel, but he was contracted by the hotel to do some AV and sound work. And so he was often there late at night for events where he would be showing up to do, uh, to do sound basically for like large parties and things like that. So we were just kind of like all there at three o'clock in the morning together, you know, drinking on the job and playing terrorizer over the the lobby speakers at, uh, you know, in the middle of the night and whatnot. And yeah, it it just kind of came together like that. And did you, did you guys already know that you wanted to play this kind of psychedelic grindcore? Where did that happen later? It kind of happened from the beginning. We had a pretty good idea. You know, we've all we've always been respectful of, of each individual person's, you know, taste and voice in the band. You know, we all three do vocals in the band and, and, you know, literally having a voice in the band has always been an important thing. So it's a very collaborative band, not to say that there isn't, you know, arguments or things like that. We have a lot of uh, what I would think of as productive conflict in our creative process. There are certainly times where people don't agree or or someone has an idea and they really have to fight for that idea and things like that. But generally speaking, yeah, we were all on the same page. Robert really wanted to start a grindcore band specifically, and Ryan and I were on board with that. And then once we all started, you know, kind of getting cooking, everybody brought in their their individual contributions and flavors and tastes on top of it. So we spoke about this a little bit before we started the interview, but Robert was already part of the scene in New York with some of the other projects he was in. What about you and Ryan? Were you guys also in bands at the time? Yeah, sure. i have been in New York a little bit longer than Ryan, and I was in a couple of bands, but nothing that was like really like touring. A couple of bands that played some shows and things like that. A, band, a punk band called Only Child, kind of like a party thrash thing when I first moved to New York called Bazooka Christ, but really didn't get going, like, you know, getting on the road or, or recording much and putting stuff out until Skull Shitter. Ryan has a very long history of playing music. He's a, he's the oldest member of the band and he's lived all over the world and has played in, you know, he played saxophone in a reggae band and all kinds of stuff, but he wasn't really playing anything at the moment. He joined Skull Shitter relatively quickly after moving to New York. And of course, Rob, I know, yeah, we did mention this, but, you know, Rob was in Mutant Supremacy, he was in Atake, he was in Trench Grinder, and Rob was certainly very pivotal in, you know, getting us going as a band. He really taught me the importance of being part of a community, being part of a scene, how you work work with people and, and the benefits you get from working with people and having those connections. So that was that was certainly very valuable for us. Can you explain a little bit more what that means in, in terms of working with other people and having connections? Oh, yeah, sure. I would use the Acheron, which is well, which was a venue in New York City, and it was a really special time and place for underground music. And Robert was in Trench Grinder and Atake with a gentleman named Bill Dozer. Bill started the Acheron. So just, you know, it became a point for, it became a, a real sort of cultural hotspot for underground heavy music. 
And the more time you spend in the scene, the more, you know, uh, Bill, you know, when we were ready to play a show, we just said, Hey, Bill, we want to play a show. And he said, yeah, sure. No problem. He put us on a show at the Akron. So, you know, having those relationships with people, with other people who are actively doing things to, to make art, make music and, and build community around venues or spaces, you know, when you're interacting, when you're working with those people or supporting their art, you know, all that is reciprocal and it certainly enabled us to, to hit the ground running when we were ready to go. You use a term to describe your creative process. Did you say productive conflict? Yes, I said I, something like that. Positive conflict, productive conflict. Yeah, that's usually between Rob and I. And I would say that we, we are like 100% on the same page about like what we want to make, but we often have like the exact opposite idea of like how we're going to make it. So a lot of times like Rob will, you know, I'll come in with riffs and I'll be, or I'll come in with like a whole song and, and Rob will be like, you know, now we're going to, you know, ask, we can't play it like that. We have to play it like this or, or yeah. And he gives actually, Rob's been a, a great productive partner too, because he really gives me a lot of direction on guitar. You know, he's very, he knows exactly what he wants and he'll be like, Oh, you know, maybe try picking it like this instead of, instead of like that, or, or, you know, try to play it, you know, play it this way, play it, play it faster, play it, play it in front of the beat, you know, whatever. So he's a real active member of the band and he's really paying attention to how, how everybody's playing. You know, he, he and Ryan work on a lot of rhythmic stuff together. So, yeah, when I talk about productive conflict, I, I mean, you know, just because people don't agree initially, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with that. And, and I think that we do a good job of not really bringing a ton of ego into it. You know, there, there's been occasions where, like, I really believe that a song should be a certain way. And if I'm going to fight for it, then, you know, Rob will respect that and he'll, and, he, and he'll play it how I want it to be played and yada, yada, yada. But usually we're working together and we're listening to each other and trying to figure out what's important and what's best for the song and, you know, all that type of stuff. It's, it's very different when you're writing a guitar riff by yourself as opposed, and what you kind of think, like when I write music, I, I get, when I write something that I like, it's because I feel like, you know, inspired in that moment. And I feel like that riff speaks to my inspiration. It's a totally another thing when someone's going to then try to put like a drum beat behind it, you know, and, uh, and tempos and, you know, trying to have consistent tempos or is the tempo going to speed up or slow down or, or whatever. So it's, it's definitely a group process. Even when someone has something that is like pretty much, written there's always going to be uh, it's going to change when the group when it comes to the group do you usually come into the group with riffs written do you come in with songs arranged or is the arranging process done when you guys are all together i'd say that's something that's that's in a little bit of a flux right now in for the most of the the history of the band we would come in with riffs and arrange together Lately, we've been a band for, I think, over 10 years now, and we're, you know, I'm, a, I'm 38, I think Rob is 37, and, or, I mean, I'm 38, I think Rob is 40, 40 and Ryan is 47, so we're all, like, in a, a mature point in our lives, and lately, uh, we've been, it's been working to have, like, I've, I've written a few songs where there hasn't been much need for arrangements, which has been nice. It makes it easy. And that might be where we're going to like kind of shift into who knows, but for the majority of the band's history, we would write riffs and then arrange together. A lot of riffs, Ryan and I would get together. We would write riffs together and then we would bring those riffs to Rob. And usually we'd have, some sort of an idea like, hey, maybe these three or four riffs are a song, or maybe these one or two riffs are a song, and these other riffs are another song. But generally speaking, we would we would bring riffs in, bring ideas in, and then write and arrange together. You mentioned your your inspiration, songs coming from from uh, inspiration that you have outside of the band. Can you tell me what that might be? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I get inspired by all kinds of different things. I, I read a lot and I always take pictures or make notes of, of things that speak to me when I'm, when I'm reading and I try to work that into my lyrical content. I really, I think if something inspires me, I want to take it and try to hold on to whatever it is that's, that's, you know, speaking to me and try to, you know, use that and, and hope that it speaks to somebody else as well through me. And then in terms of just, riffs or, or music you know whenever you're 
whenever you're listening to something and you feel inspired, it could be, you know, you purposely try to learn the riff so you can, you know, use it, you know, or rework it somehow. Or maybe you, you, you hear something and you like it and you just want to try to play something that sounds, maybe you don't even, you're not playing it in the same key or you're not playing the same riff even, but, you know, you can use that, that moment of inspiration to try to come up with something similar.